Welcome to Access Church. We're stoked you're with us. Before we get into the teaching today, grab your Bible, your note sheet, and maybe your favorite beverage, and be ready to receive all that God has for you today. What's up, Access Church, uh, Mark Porter, Regeneration Church, Ocean Beach. Glad to be with you guys here today. Uh, I want to start off by just saying um, we're going to continue to be in prayer for Pastor Brian. 
uh, and his family. Uh, uh, Pastor Brian, if you're watching this, Christine, the whole crew, uh, know that we're down in OB. We're praying for you guys. Uh, we know that God's going to do something miraculous and, and, and big um, out of this and through this, uh, that God will be glorified. Uh, and that he will bring joy even into this situation. So know, know, you, know that we're with you guys in this. Uh, I want to talk to you guys today about an encounter that Jesus has uh, uh, with a woman, and it really shows the true heart of who Jesus is. I was going to jump into Colossians and try and tie some stuff in uh, with where Pastor Brian has been going, but I really feel that this is what the Lord wants us to hear today. Uh, Mark chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, I'm kind of just going to jump right in uh, uh, to where we're going. Um, uh, th this is a glorious event. This is a picture of, of really how it was for me and you when we first met Jesus. And sometimes we can forget that. Sometimes we get so far or advanced in our Christian walk that we forget how desperate we were, how, how needy we were for the Lord, how great a, a gift of salvation really was. So it's a great reminder of where all of us were at one point if you were saved. Or maybe it's a, it's a great way to see uh, where your life could be if you're not a follower of Jesus here today. But in Mark chapter 5, Jesus had been on the scene for a while. He's already been teaching in all the towns uh, around Jerusalem, preaching the gospel. He's healed many. He's raised some people from the dead. He's been casting demons out of uh, people. And, and Jesus' fame goes before him. Everywhere he goes, these crowds just come flocking in as they notice and recognize him. Wherever he goes, uh, wherever he speaks, there's crowds come. They catch a glimpse of this man. Uh, the, this man. Many come for healing. Many come to bring their friends for healing. Many come to just see or, or to hear what he might say. Uh, and in Mark chapter 5, verse 24, we start off with this. It says this, and a great crowd followed him and thronged around him. Now, now the, that word thronged, it literally means to, to choke out or to stifle. So can you picture what's going on here? Uh, again, what, what we try to do in, in Regeneration Church is I try to get people to, to put themselves right in the story of the Bible, hear the sounds, uh, uh, smell the smells, see the crowd, really, really feel the heat of the day or whatever might be going on. Put yourself in that story to, to see. Maybe you, you came to hear Jesus speak. Maybe you came to be healed or maybe you brought a loved one or a friend to come to be healed by Jesus. Maybe you just saw the crowd as you were passing by doing your thing and you were like, man, what's going on over here? And you kind of just came over to check it out to see what's going on, whatever it might be. But put yourself in the story, a hot and normal day, but something different is going to be happening here today. A mob has ascended around this man. This man that, 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 that some are saying is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And you've heard the stories, but could it be true? Could he be the one? And now the crowds are out of control, man. People are everywhere. The noise is dying. It's just out of control. There's chaos going on. But in the middle of that, listen, church, in the middle of all the chaos, Jesus isn't tripping. In the middle of all the chaos, Jesus isn't tripping. In the midst of the chaos, Jesus is calm, cool, and collected, never hurried, never rushed, never being shown as being annoyed at the crowds, never being annoyed at what was going on around him. He doesn't seem to be bothered by that at all. And listen to me, church. We have to hear this, especially in the chaos that we're living in right now. Jesus is not bothered by me and you as we come and seek him out either. He, he's not bothered as you come with your wants, your needs, your worries, your doubts, your fears, whatever it might be in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic or in the middle of what you might be dealing with right now. God is not ever annoyed. Jesus is never annoyed as you come to him. We got to get that kind of theology out of the church because far too many people have bought into that and that keeps us from running to Jesus keeps us from getting on our knees. It keeps us from humbling ourselves and, and, and running to him. He is never annoyed. He is never in too much of a hurry to stop and to listen to your prayers. You are not a burden to the Lord access church. We got to get this out of the church because, because Jesus is, is always seen as bidding us to come to him, never pushing us away. In fact, he's always drawing near to us. He never runs from the chaos. He never runs from the mess. He always presses in in those situations. So Jesus is here doing his stuff and the crowds are going crazy. And then we get this in verse 25. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, one who had suffered much under many positions and had spent all that she had and was no better, but actually grew worse. Now, now maybe you're not a woman in here. I mean, there's a lot of dudes that go to cross or to, to access church. So, so I know that, that it's hard for sometimes for as a man to, to put yourself in the story, but put yourself in this woman's story. Put, let, let, let her feelings be your feelings. Let her experience be your experience. This, were, that this woman is a perfect picture of me and you in the Bible. Uh, most of us uh, in church today can relate to these verses right here. Most of us don't have to look too far back in our lives to be right where she was, to have her words really be ours. And most of us still have this fresh on our resumes as a constant reminder of our old life. 
that life that we hated, but we just couldn't get past, that life that we, that, that we knew wasn't really us, but a life that we continued to run back to over and over and over again. And look, this woman, this poor lady, man, she had a female problem, right? She has a flow of blood, something I sure had completely wrecked her life. It was something, just some small problem. This was a huge deal. And the Bible here is clear that it wasn't just a small problem. This was a huge burden, a huge deal that she had been dealing with for a long, long time. I mean, 12 years. Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the heartache? 12 years of praying, 12 years of hoping, 12 years of humiliation, 12 years of shame, 12 years of embarrassment. And look again, most of us here can relate to this poor woman. We've been in her shoes. We've all got some shady stuff in our in our past, pack, past or in our background that makes us feel shame and makes us feel like this woman. Listen, I, I was a full-on. Many, many of you guys know my story. I was a full-on uh, alcoholic and addict for 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 close to 15 years. 15 years of my life living in, in a prison that I had made for myself. 15 years uh, of wanting to change but, and hoping to change, but never really finally uh, realizing how I could do it on my own. Nothing was working for me. Really, things just seemed to get worse and worse as I tried to fix myself and as I tried to solve the problem. And some of you guys can relate to this too. But, but in our church in OB, man, this is the story of Regeneration Church. Most of the people coming into our church, this is their story. Just jacked up lives, just desperate for help, but having no idea even how to get there. And then towards the end of this, and towards the end of my addiction, man, I had lost all hope of ever getting better. I had lost all hope that a change could ever happen. I had lost all hope that I could ever be set free from this crazy addiction that I was in bondage to but Jesus. But Jesus is a word or a phrase that we say over and over again in our church. Jesus isn't done yet. Jesus rose from the grave and he is not done in your situation. Uh, it is, he is still working. He is still sovereign. He is still in control. So for 12 years, this woman suffered in silence. But that's not all. The Bible also said this. She had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but actually grew worse. Look, she had gone to all the doctors. All right, she had tried all the medications. She had tried all the procedures. She had done everything the doctors had told her to do, and she had exhausted every avenue for this kind of condition. She had tried all that man could offer, and nothing was working. In fact, the Bible says she rather grew worse. And listen to me, church, I don't know about you, and I don't know about your recovery or your Jesus story, but again, this hits home, close to home with me. You see, when I was trying to get sober and trying to get my life back together, I tried everything that I could to get better. I tried self help books. I tried groups. I tried philosophy. I tried all that Eastern religion could try and offer me. I tried everything man had to offer me, but nothing helped. Nothing. Rather, I grew worse. I was a train wreck completely off the rails and nothing, nothing was working. Nothing was helping. I had tried everything but Jesus. Just like in our story here, listen to me, church, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the solution. Jesus is the only way for this woman to get better. And this Jesus is the only way for me and you to get out of the situations we're in right now. He's always the answer. And Jesus, Jesus is just one call away. Jesus is just one call away. And why is it that you and I wait so long in our lives? Or why is it that we try everything else in our lives uh, before we run to Jesus? Like we, we go here for answers. We look over here for and when nothing else seems to work and when nothing else is seeming to help our situations, then, then we'll try a little bit of Jesus. And listen, I'm not talking about people outside the church. I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about people in the church, me and you, doing this kind of thing. We try and we run to everything instead of running first to the one who has power to heal, the power to quiet our storms, the one who loves us and who is for us, and the one who alone has power to do the miraculous in our lives. Let's now run to Jesus first, church, not as a last resort. Run to Jesus first and not last. He is our first resort, not our last resort. The very moment we see the storm clouds coming, the very moment fear hits us, the very moment life gets chaotic, and the very moment things start to go sideways in your chaotic world, why don't we hit our knees in humble submission to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords? We need to remember that He gives grace to the humble, that when we humble ourselves, then we're met with grace, then we're met with mercy, then we're met with love, and then we're met with a compassion that only Jesus can give us. Those that come low to Him and those that seek Him first, seek first the kingdom of God. And then lastly here, we read she had spent all that she had. For 12 years, this woman had thrown money at anyone and everything that could help have helped her. She had exhausted every outlet trying to find the cure. And in doing so, in doing so she spent all that she had. Again, how many of us have been there? 
We spent it all, man. My mom spent countless, countless amounts of money in, in rehab, bailing me out of jail, sending money to prison, doing all this stuff for me. I mean, it's just tons and tons of money trying to and hoping and wishing that I would get better, praying all the while that I would get better, but nothing, none of that money was seeming to do anything, but rather she grew worse. But Jesus, but Jesus, church, Jesus has a plan. Jesus was on the scene and Jesus was about to do something miraculous in her life. And listen, not just there in her life, Jesus wants to do something miraculous in your life as well. Jesus is on the move, church. Jesus is up to something even now in the chaos we're living in. Don't give up. Verse 27. She had heard the reports about Jesus. So she here she is, hopeless, just kind of beside herself, probably just resigned. This is the way her life is always going to be. Nothing could help. I've tried everything. This is just the way it's going to be. But then she heard Jesus had come to town. Right, right, and immediately her mind came to the stories of how he healed the lepers, how he made the blind to see, even how he'd raised people from the dead, and how the deaf can even hear because of what Jesus had done. But I'm sure she's thinking, but, but not me. Certainly not me. I'm sure that she thought to herself, not me. I'm, I'm too far gone. I've tried everything else. I'm sure he couldn't help me, but somehow, some way, this woman, with the small amount of faith that she had, she let it grow. And as it, as it began to grow, as her faith began to grow, she told herself that there might be a chance. Maybe this Jesus could even help her in her miserable condition. Maybe this Jesus could cure her and give her her life back. So she goes, holding on to the only thing left that she had, uh, and that was the hope that was in her heart. But listen, 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 as bad as that situation is for that woman with this issue of blood, it was made, it was made worse because by the law of Moses, she was deemed unclean. Meaning she, she, can't, she can't be in the crowd. She can't be among these people. She shouldn't even be there with Jesus. And she knew this. And, and, and to make matters worse, the whole town, by this time, after 12 years, the whole town knew who she was. So she has to come in secret. I mean, she should be isolated. She shouldn't be around all these people. She, she would have to yell, unclean, unclean, to all the people there in the crowd. And they would step back from her. So there's all this guilt, all this shame already given to her. And to make, make it worse, to make it into the crowd, she had to hide her face. She had to keep Keep low so nobody would recognize her. She had to sneak in to get a touch from Jesus, to get close to him. She had broken the law to be there. She's unclean. She shouldn't be there. But listen to me, church, she didn't let any of that stop her. She didn't let any of that stop her from getting into the presence of the Lord. And the Bible says this, she came up from behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Now again, this points to her shame. Notice she doesn't come in front of Jesus to touch him and talk to him. She comes from behind. She's like, I don't want him to really see me. I don't really want him to notice. I'm just going to kind of sneak in and try and sneak out. She knew, she knew that Jesus knew the law better than anyone else. And she knew how the religious leaders had certainly treated her before, right? She knew that they, that they would throw her out of the synagogue, that they, she would, they would throw her out of the temple. They would throw her out of the crowds, not letting her get near to them because of her situation. You see, she wasn't sure she wasn't sure what Jesus would do with her. She knew how these other religious leaders had treated her, and she wasn't sure, is Jesus going to treat me that same way? So she came scared. She came ashamed. She came guilty up from behind, having faith that he could heal her, but not sure if he would accept her. And again, haven't we been there, man? When I'm, I remember when I first cried out to Jesus, I was like, man, Jesus, I know I've heard some stories. I didn't really know. The, I didn't grow up in the church, so I didn't know a whole lot, but I, I'd heard some stories. But I was like, he, he's not going to want me in the family. He's not going to want me to come close. I mean, I am jacked up. I got a, I got a wake of destruction behind me. He, that, that, he's not going to want me coming in, but the exact opposite is true. So she comes up from behind Jesus. She touches the hem of his garment, saying, If I just touch even his garment, I will be made well. In this church, this speaks of the amazing faith that this woman had. The amazing faith that just with a small amount of faith, the mustard seed size of faith that it can move mountains, Jesus tells us. So again, I don't know where your faith, I don't know where you, where you land here today. Maybe you're just holding on. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're in the middle of a crazy situation. Maybe all the faith you have left is about that big. Well, Jesus says, I can work with that. Jesus says, I can use that. And he uses it in a miraculous, miraculous ways. Listen, church, do you have that kind of faith here today to trust in Jesus? The kind of faith that trusts in Jesus to heal when nothing else has worked? The kind of faith that says, I'm going against everything and everyone because I have to see Jesus? The kind of faith that says, nothing is going to stop me from getting where I need to be? I pray you have that faith, church. Verse 29. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed from her disease. Listen, church, she comes to Jesus with her fear, her shame, her guilt, and the small amount of faith that she can muster up. And she touches the hem of his garment. And in that very 
moment she encounters glory in the form of divine healing. The Lord Jesus touch, the touch has, has healed her, has done something amazing inside of her. She experiences the glory of God from his backside and immediately her whole life has changed. Immediately she is healed and immediately she's a brand new creation. And that is awesome, church. That's the Jesus we worship. That is what he has for those who will come close to him, even those who they think shouldn't be there, but those who come anyway. Those who society has says, man, you've done too much, you're too far gone. Our Jesus says, no, no, draw near to me. I want to make even you, even you a new creation. So she touches his garment and then this happens. Verse 30, and Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately Jesus turns around in the crowd and says, who touched my garments? Right, power, supernatural, miraculous, and divine healing power had just come out of Jesus. <clears throat> the power to stop the flow of blood, the power to stop your addiction, the power to conquer your fears, the power to conquer your depression, the power to overcome even the sin that is holding you in bondage right now. Power. Who could use some power in their lives right now, church? I know most of us, most of us, if we answered honestly, we would say, man, I need some of that, that power. But listen, listen, as the power comes out, the Bible says this, Jesus turned around. Jesus was going this way. Jesus was planning on going over there. He didn't plan on coming back here. He was, he was going through. He, he had no plan, intentions of stopping in that town. In fact, Jesus was on his way to heal somebody else. And then this thing's happened, and, and the Bible tells us that Jesus turned around. This is one of the deepest theological sentences in all the New Testament, that Jesus was just passing through. He had no intention of staying here. He was on his way to heal another person. But here, Jesus shows that he's never too busy for one of his children. Jesus turned around to see who touched him. He wants to find this woman. And do you know that this woman had probably shrieked away. She probably touched him, got healed, and she probably is pulling back thinking, thinking man, I got to get away because I don't want them to know who I am or what I've, I've, I've done. She's scared at first to reveal herself because, listen, she's sure that she, she, if she does reveal herself, if she does see, let herself be seen by Jesus, that Jesus would be upset, that Jesus would reject her, that he would treat her according to the law, that he will treat her like all the other people had treated her for 12 years. And again, that's, that, that kind of thought has kept far too many people from the church. I can't go in there. They, do you know what I've done? Do you know where I've been? Do you know the sin that I'm still struggling with right now? But this lady did come forward and listen to me, church, how many Christians today are unwilling to return to the church or unwilling to return to the Lord because they think they'll be met with opposition, condemnation, and judgment. How many of us stayed away from the church and stayed away from the giver of life himself because of this very reason? And listen carefully to me, Access Church. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's not, that's not the, the Jesus that we worship. No, no, no. We, we will see just how the Lord does deal with this, this woman and how he does deal with people like me and you. He doesn't turn them away. He turns around. He wants to be close to them. He wants to draw near to them. Verse 31, and his disciples said to him, you see the crowds pressing around you, and yet you say, who, who touched you? The, who, who touched me? They're like, Jesus, what are you talking about, man? There's no way we would know who touched you. There's no way we could figure this out. And then verse 32 says this, and he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear, trembling, and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Now, Jesus looks around for who touched him. And this woman now healed, now set free, now made well. She's still walking in fear. She's still walking in guilt and she's still walking in the shame that, that, that Jesus had just pulled out from her. Right, right. Listen, how many of us have been set free? How many of us have been rescued? How many of us have been redeemed by Jesus, but we still walk in the guilt and the shame of what Jesus freed us from? Like when I was an alcoholic and addict, Jesus pulled that from me. But there was a long time in my life when I still walked in that same shame and that same guilt of the things that I had done. And Jesus had set me free from those things. So sometimes it takes some time to really let it sink in. All that we've been healed from, all that we've been set free from, all that we've been forgiven from, right? We, we, we see on the outside what the Lord has done for us. But for some reason, it takes some time for the inside to catch up to that thought process. Like, like I see it, but it's hard for me to really believe what is happening. I know I'm free, but I've lived my life like this for far too long. So it takes a bit of time for it to completely register in my head. How many of us have been set free from lives that we once lived in, but we're still slaves to our past? Listen, church, we got to stop looking backwards. we got to start looking forward and moving forward with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Our, 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 when you're driving your car... 
your windshield is much, much bigger than your rear view mirror for a reason. Because if you keep looking at that bad boy long enough, you're going to run into everything in front of you. Me and you, every once in a while, yeah, we can glance back. And it's good to kind of keep note of what's going on behind you. But, 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 but most importantly, especially in our walk with the Lord, let's keep looking forward. Not what's back there. What's back there wants to kill, to steal, and to destroy, and to knock us down. What Jesus has for us up here, that's what we need to be focused on. We, we need to remember that me and you are not our sin. We are not our past. We are not the grand sum of all the mistakes that me and you have ever made in our lives. We are now set free. We are now healed. We are now overcomers by the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen, church, you are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Even if you don't feel that way today, if you feel like you're still that old you, that the past is still beating you up, the scars are still fresh, the wounds are still open, humble yourself, get back on your knees, come calling back to Jesus and listen to his words, listen to the words of the Bible, not the words of the enemy that are chirping in your ear even now. And just like this woman in our story, you can be made whole. You can re receive divine healing. Jesus can begin to take the broken, fragmented pieces of your life and begin to beautifully put them together to give you a brand new story. We have to remember that Jesus Christ is the ever-present, victorious King of all the ages, and nothing, nothing can stop him from moving in your life. So he touches this woman. No, this woman touches him, touches his garment. She's immediately healed by the power of Jesus. Jesus, knowing something has happened because of, because of, the, 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 because of the crowd uh, going on here, because of the things that are happening here, Jesus being God, he, he knew right away what was going on, that this woman was scared, that she was fearful of how, how, how people might act towards her. Even she he, even, even kind of perceives this woman is, is shrieking back. He, she's scared of even me, even though I just healed her. She doesn't know what to do here. She comes forward to him and she tells, and the Bible says, she tells him everything. She lays it all out and that's a scary thing to do man to lay out your whole life all your sins all your past all the all the junk but but as she does this freedom comes to this woman and listen as me and you do this freedom comes to us as we lay out our hurts as we lay out lay out our past as we lay out all the the scary things in our lives freedom comes as we come clean with and to jesus i'm sure she came with trepidation trepidation but she waits to see how jesus will deal with her and listen not only her but the Pharisees in the crowd, man, now they're privy to what's going on. The Pharisees and the religious leaders that are in the crowd certainly want to see what's going on here. They know that according to the law, she should not be there, right? Imagine it. She's unclean. She lays it all out to Jesus. I shouldn't have been here. I broke the law. Imagine what the crowd is doing. Thick, shoulder to shoulder, standing close as they can. But as soon as she says what's going on, I'm sure some people start to back away from her. Some people are like, man, I don't want to be near that woman. I don't want to be near her. I don't want to catch what maybe she has. Everyone backs away from her but not Jesus. Jesus doesn't back away. Everyone draws back from her, but Jesus, Jesus of the gospel, Jesus draws close to her, comes up to her, uh, maybe kneeling down with her in the dirt, maybe picking up her head, maybe holding her in his arms. I don't really know. That's the picture I always see of Jesus with this woman just getting close with her. Maybe she's down just in, in tears, knowing what's going on, scared of what's going to really happen, but Jesus draws close to her. Maybe he holds her, his, his, her, 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 her head in his hands, making her look into his eyes. And then Jesus says this, verse 34, and he said to her daughter, daughter, that, that's a word that that woman probably hadn't heard in a long, long time. I, I imagine she's older and nobody's called her that, but Jesus now calls her daughter. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So this woman, this lawbreaker, this outcast, this one who had been ostracized and kept out for most of her life. Jesus, as everyone steps back from her, Jesus comes near to her and his first words to her are, daughter. Can you feel the weight for this woman? Can you feel the, the weight of that, the words that would have for this woman? I mean, you have to see the countenance on Jesus' face as he says, daughter to her. He can't say daughter with condemnation. He can't say daughter with contempt or judgment in his voice, but only love and acceptance. He's saying, daughter, you're mine. You're, you're here. You're, you're home. You don't have to worry about what they're doing. You, you are mine. You are protected. You are provided for, and I'm caring for you even now. You are loved more than you can ever imagine and notice what he says lastly to her he says your faith has made you well you see here wasn't it wasn't her getting it all figured out that made her well it wasn't her fixing herself that had made her well it wasn't her doing enough good stuff that made her well to make jesus heal her it was her faith her belief that jesus would and could take even the small amount of faith that she could muster up in that moment and use it to do the miraculous in her life faith church 
faith. That's what Jesus is looking for. That's what Jesus, in, 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 in this book, we, we see over and over and over again, you, Jesus using to heal people, to touch people, to save people. Faith that even after 12 years of suffering and after 12 years of spending all the money she had, that Jesus could work in her situation. Faith, church, remember, Jesus says that even the small amount of faith, the small amount of faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. Jesus wants to move some mountains, Access Church. Jesus wants to move some mountains in our lives. And then he goes on and says this lastly to her. He says, go in peace. Hallelujah. Go in peace. She came in fear, but now I want you to leave in peace. She came in guilt. She came in shame, but now I want you to go in peace. Go out peacefully. She came with her head low, hiding her face. Jesus says, now go out with your head held high, declaring the glory of the Lord and the sharing, the grace and the mercy you have just received. Go in peace, he says, and be healed of your disease. Can you imagine the emotions that this woman is going through? Can you imagine just the range of, of, of emotions that, that, that are happening here? She was hopeless in her situation, but now she leaves hope-filled. She came empty-handed, but now she leaves full. She, she came broken, but leaves completely healed. She came an outcast, but she leaves being a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's what the Lord wants to do for me and you, church. I always remember that even in the chaos, Jesus draws near. Even when we think we shouldn't be there, Jesus draws near. He constantly is inviting me and you, jacked up as we might be. He is constantly inviting me and you in. So, I, man, I, again, I don't know what's going on. I don't know how Temecula is handling the COVID. I know how OB is, and, man, OB is just as jacked up as ever. It's always a little bit jacked up, but we're going through some chaos and some, some crazy times that we need to know and we need to remember as we read the Bible. Jesus doesn't get far and distant there. He gets close and near. Jesus is personal. Jesus is with you and for you, even in this lay down your burdens to him, draw near to him today. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for Access Church. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing there. I thank you for Pastor Brian, Christine. Lord, I thank you for for the situation that is going on in that home. Lord, we pray for your hand to be upon it. We pray for blessing, Lord. We pray for encouragement, Lord. We pray for for, for just a, a miracle to happen there. I pray for Access Church so that you would continue to work there. Lord, I pray that you would open the doors of that school even sooner than they could ever dream or imagine so they could get back to to worshiping together again. But Lord, as we continue to do it this way, I pray that the people would draw close even now in the the only way you've given us now. Thank you, Lord, for, for, for your grace that we can still even do this that we can have messages, that we can hear worship, that we can, can hear, more importantly, we can hear from you, Lord Jesus. Continue to speak to us, continue to be with us, continue to move in us. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for what you're doing even now. It's in Jesus' beautiful, mighty, and matchless name and all God's people said, amen. I love you guys.
their children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in the thousand generations in your family and your children and their children
search the world it couldn't fill me man's empty praise treasures that fade are never enough yes and you came along and put me back together satisfied here in your love yes oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all and you still call me friend yes you do oh yes it's the God of the mountain it's the God of the valleys and there's not a place your mercy and your grace won't find me
Thanks for joining us. For more resources, to get involved, or to invest in the ministries at Access Church, visit go to Take care.